I remember when I was um, planning to go to Westminster Seminary. I planned to do that for three years before I got there. And in that time that I did that, I read everything I could get my hands on by the faculty there. And I read about their biographies. And, um, and so I had a pretty good idea that I knew who these people were who were going to be my teachers. But it's interesting, if you've ever had a situation like that, when you've gotten to know people uh, through their writings or maybe through vignettes of their speaking uh, or through their biographies, uh, getting or knowing about someone and getting to know that person are really two different things. And there were things that I just didn't expect about uh, some of my professors. I did not expect Dr. Ferguson to have the wry sense of humor that he had. Um, I can remember, some of you will remember Harvey Kahn. Harvey Kahn was a missionary in uh, South Korea, and he and Bruce Hunter, really the reason why Christianity is spread as it has in South Korea. And uh, Harvey Kahn was teaching at Westminster when I was there. I remember the first time we'd gone to visit, and somebody tapped me on the shoulder. I was in Van Til Hall, and I turned around, and there's a man in blue jeans and a, and a flannel shirt and suspenders, and he said, hi, I'm Harvey. And after we talked, after he had left, my, my wife said, who, was that like the maintenance man or something? And I said, no, dear, that was, that was Harvey Kahn. And, and what that showed me, what that really uh, made stand out for me is that knowing about someone and knowing someone are two different things. And it's like that with God, you know, knowing about God and knowing God are not the same thing. And we see that particularly as we begin looking at the gospel of John today. It's a gospel of encounter. And in the gospel of John, uh, we're going to meet people. We're going to meet some professional students of the Bible. They're called the scribes. And we're going to meet some professional theologians, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who knew a lot about God. But as the story unfolds, we see that they're people who don't know God. It's odd, isn't it? They knew theology, they knew the Bible, but they didn't know God. And when they encountered him, they didn't recognize him. He was not what they were expecting. And the mistake that they made is that they thought that by, by, by studying the Bible, by studying theology, they could, they could comprehend and contain God. If not control him, they at least wanted to be able to predict him, to be able to tell others with certainty what God would and would not do, what he could and could not do. They wanted to be able to render God safe. So they wanted a God that was safe, that was comprehensible, a God who lived by the rules that they had established for him by their Bible reading. And the Gospel of John is a book about encounter. It's about encountering God. John's purpose in writing it is not merely that you would know about encountering God, but that in Jesus Christ, you may encounter God. And so as we begin our study in the Gospel of John today, I want to ask you a question. It's really an all-important question. It's a question that we all ought to ask ourselves from time to time. And the question for you to ask yourself is this. Do I want to encounter God? Do I want to know God? Or am I content simply knowing about him? Because not everyone wants to know God. And if you don't, the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law stand as an eternal testament 
that a great place to hide from him is church and Bible study and theology. Not everyone who knows about God wants to know him. Let me read to you the opening words of John's gospel today, and this is the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent or of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the only begotten who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God the only begotten God, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And our Father, we pray that as we look at this gospel, this Lord, which is your word, that you'd send your Holy Spirit to us, that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit, so that through this, your word, Lord, we would not merely know about you, but would know you, and in knowing you, be conformed to the image of your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. The God who created everything created us to know him. You know, if a pious Jew in the first century were to hear John's gospel being read, and it was uh, read slowly, and he heard only the first three words, he would think that what he was hearing was the opening declaration of the book of Genesis in the beginning. I think that John does that deliberately. He wants us to know that the God he is speaking about is the God of Genesis, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who has made all things. But John goes on to tell us something that they would not have expected. You see, they knew that God had created by his word. We read in that opening book of the Bible, then God said, and it was. And we see that happening over and over again. God spoke, and it was. But here's what's unexpected. That word, which was with God... John tells us the word was God. And John tells us something here, something that's going on, which all of their theologizing would have never led them to. The belief of the Jews and their, the teaching of their scriptures is that there's one true God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Through the prophet Isaiah, God had said, I am God, and there is no other. And there's only one God. John believes that. He'll affirm it 
throughout this gospel. And yet he tells us that this word who was with God, and as we read the uh, unfolding of John, we have to say who, this word who was with God also was God. How can someone be with God and also be God? It's not at all intuitive. But throughout the Gospel of John, it's not uh, John's intention to give us information in the abstract about who he is. It's his intention to show us who he is. And he's going to tell us in verse 14 that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. There's one God, and the Father is God, and the only begotten is God. Now, you know what's funny about that statement is that when I read the New Testament and I encounter Jesus, when I go back to the Old Testament, I can see foreshadowings of that truth. But without Jesus, without the revelation of Jesus in the New Testament, if you had given me a Hebrew Bible and imparted to me the greatest knowledge of Hebrew hermeneutics, I would have never come to that conclusion. Nor did any of the scribes or Pharisees or teachers of the law. The scriptures that they had told them a great deal about God, but knowing about God and knowing God is not the same thing. And not everyone who knows about God wants to know God. We were created to encounter God, but not everyone wants to. And so John, as he... uh, writes these opening words, sets us up for what he's going to tell us in verse 14, that the word became flesh, that God became a human being, that the creator became a creature, but not any creature. He became a creature made in the image of God. And you think about that for a moment, that God who made mankind in his own image then became the image of what he himself is the word became flesh and john tells us that the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world that he came to his own and he says although the world was made through him the world did not recognize him And what do you think that means? You know, oftentimes in the New Testament, that word world uh, is used not merely of the cosmos, but it's used of a system that is in opposition to God. And I read this, and my first thought would be, well, that must be what he's talking about, that he was in the world, and and the world that's in opposition to him didn't recognize him. My first thought would be that it's the It's the sinners, it's the irreligious and ungodly who don't recognize him. But as we read through the Gospel of John, well, the strange thing is that those are precisely the kind of people who do recognize him, the ungodly and the irreligious and the sinners. John says he came to his own, and in the original language, Uh, We could translate this, he came to his own things. In fact, uh, my translation says he came to that which was his own. Uh, He came to his own realm. He came to the world that he created. He came to what he owns. He came to what's his by right. He came to his own. He came to what was created through him. And then John says his own did not receive him, but he he changes the grammar there a little bit. In the original now, he moves to people. He came to his own things, but his own people did not receive him. His own people, 
meaning the Jewish people, but all of the disciples that we encounter in John's gospel are Jewish people. All of the early church are Jewish people. The people who should have known him best were the theologians, the Bible readers, the Bible experts. But not everyone who knows about God wants to know him. You know, it bears saying again, I've given you this definition before, but let me do it again. Theology is the human echo of the divine voice. And theology sometimes uh, gets a bad rap. Sometimes people will say, yeah, we don't need theology, we just need the Bible. But theology is necessary because human beings are persons, not blocks of wood, at least not most of us. And we need to be not merely passive readers of God's word, but we need to be active thinkers about it, active engagers of it. In the Old Testament, we read of this practice of meditation. The word uh, means to repeat, to mutter, to ponder over. And as, and as God's word filters through our minds, we grasp parts of it, we restate it in our own words, we try to condense it, and we make maps of what it means. And friends, that's uh, all doing theology is. Uh, people could do that to a more or less sophisticated level. But, but anybody who does any thinking about what they read in the scripture is doing theology. And everyone who does theology will be changed by the exercise of it. But theology is the human echo of the divine voice. Theology is always an approximation, always a model, always a perspective on the truth. Theology is always inadequate, always partial, always incomplete, always one-dimensional. And the mistake of the scribes and Pharisees, and some people today, is to think that their theology is the truth. And that notion is a way of trying to contain God, to control God, to confine God so that we can safely manage him. But God's truth displayed in his word and carried out in his world will always overflow the bounds of our theology. You know, let me give you an example of, of, of what that might look like, an analogy. Some of you know that I teach uh, Greek at Loudoun Classical School and uh, use a Greek grammar, and particularly um, last couple of years, last year and this coming year, I get to teach just the Greek 2 class, which I'm happy about because the Greek 1 class is just a lot of memorization vocabulary, paradigms, and we have tenses and voices and moods and these endless paradigms. And every once in a while, we just have to have a day where we go outside and do something fun because my kids' heads look like they're going to explode with all this stuff. But I like when we get to Greek, too, because after they've memorized all of these nouns and all of their various cases and the way that prepositions work, and, uh, and, and, and myriad tenses and voices and, and, and moods of, uh, of Greek verbs and participles and, uh, and, and vocabulary that we finally get to the place in Greek too where I can give them some leaves of the New Testament and they can begin to read them. We do some translation together and that's the fun part. What invariably happens, a lot of times it will be something from the Gospel of John or 1st or 2nd, 3rd John, or maybe from Ephesians um, or 1st Peter. 
invariably what happens as we're reading along, they'll come up upon something uh, in the scripture and they'll say, Dr. Hammond, John got this wrong. He said it wrong. He didn't follow the rules of grammar. He got it wrong. And, and I always have to tell them that the rules of grammar are our attempt to explain what native Greek writers usually did. They're not there for us to dictate to them what they can do. If you want to know how Greek actually works, read the text, not the grammar. The theology is our attempt at explaining what God usually does. We misuse it when we try to dictate back to God what he can do, what he can be like, uh, what he can say in his word or do in his world. And the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law stand as a perpetual reminder that if you want to avoid encountering God, studying the Bible, particularly in the light of what this rabbi says and that rabbi says, we call it theology, as a way of boxing God in and confining him and controlling him, so that he's safe for you to deal with is a great way to avoid encountering him. If that doesn't make you just a little bit nervous, you're not paying attention. Because reading the Bible and theology can be a way of avoiding encountering God. And John is preparing us here for the encounter. John tells us that we can know about God through the prophets. The greatest of these, undoubtedly, was Moses. He tells us, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The latest, and you could make the argument, the last of those Old Testament prophets was John the Baptist. And... The Apostle John tells us there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He tells us John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. John prepares us at the outset for the encounter with God. And the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law missed it. You know, you read through the Gospel of John, or any of the Gospels, what stands out to you is what most characterizes the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. You know what stands out to me? Their arrogance. They were certain that they had God all figured out. If you thought something different than they did, why then you were a fool, you were God's enemy. But as you think through the Bible, what most characterizes those who actually encounter God? You know what it is? It's humility. After Job encounters God, he's got nothing more to say. He puts his hand to his mouth. Isaiah, the prophet who undoubtedly was very familiar with the writings of Moses when he sees God, cries out, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips and of a people of unclean lips. And in Numbers 12, the testimony about Moses was that he was the most humble man on the face of the earth. The prophets all point us to God, but it's possible to know God without, or uh, uh, it's possible to know about God without knowing him. It seems that before the coming of Jesus, 
Few people encountered God. I say that because Jesus said to his disciples in Luke 10, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and many kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. John tells us no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father has made him known. John uses a particular word here that we translate to make him known. It's it's the Greek word exegeomai. We get our word exegesis from that word. If you've been around church for a while, you've heard that word exegesis. Right, and you speak about exegeting texts of scriptures. Once I was teaching a class for the C.S. Lewis Institute, because these are all church people, theologically savvy people, I used the word, words a couple of times, uh, exegesis and hermeneutics, and somebody raised their hand, and they said, what's the difference between those things, exegesis and hermeneutics? And I said, oh, well. I said, uh, I said exegesis uh, comes from a compounded Greek word that means to lead out, so it means to uh, lead out the meaning of the text. And hermeneutics comes from another Greek word, sounds very much like that word, and it means to interpret the text. And he said, "Uh uh-huh. He said, and what's the difference between those two? And I said, oh my, look at the time. (laughs) But that really got me to thinking, you know, what is the difference between those two? I have a sense of a difference, a kind of an intuitive difference. And I I realized as I thought about it that in, in exegesis, what we do is we look at the text, we look at the grammar, we look at the construction, we look at the context, and we figure out all of the possible meanings, all of the possibilities. Good exegesis keeps us from jumping to conclusions. In hermeneutics, we try to decide which of them is the right one. The theologians of Jesus' day wanted to be God's interpreters. They wanted to be his hermeneuticists. They wanted to decide um, what God could and could not do. To close off the richness of God's working in the world, to box God in because it made him safe to deal with. But Jesus comes to us and he exegetes God for us. He opens up all the possibilities. You know, I've walked with the Lord for 40 some years now. I can hardly believe that. I still remember hearing the gospel for the first time. What I've learned in that time, friends, is that God refuses to be boxed in. He won't conform himself to my theology. Nor will he allow what he is and how he works to be defined by the rules that we come up with for him. The Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law wanted a safe God, wanted a tame God, wanted a predictable God. A God in truth, as you look at how they operate, that they could use to control others with. And so when God actually showed up, they did not recognize him. Would you? It's a question I've asked myself from time to time. If I lived in the first century, would I recognize Jesus of Nazareth as God? I said at the beginning that the all-important question for you to ask yourself is, do I want to encounter God? Do I want to know God? Or are you content just knowing about him? Because not everybody who knows about God really wants to know him. The theologians of Jesus' day didn't want to know him. 
I don't misunderstand, as I said before. Theology is not bad. It's necessary. We have to do it. But, but if you really encounter God in Jesus Christ, if you're not content just to know about him, you're going to have your, your grids and your ideas stretched. And, and I think over the years of things that, that I believed were true, that I still think are true, but they're not true in quite the same way as I thought. Or they're, or they're true in larger ways than I thought. Because if you want to really encounter God, the ride will never be comfortable. You'll, you'll, know, you'll never know anything of what he reveals so well that you can say, okay, I'm done with that. Let me put it in my back pocket. What's next? Your models, your approximations, the thing we call theology, aren't the truth. They may be more or less true, but they're not the truth. And as John will show us as we get into his gospel, that Jesus is the truth. And his word is truth. And he's come into the world so that you may encounter God. Do you want to? Father, give us your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. That we would desire to know you, not merely to know about you. And Father, help us in encountering you, not only to see the wonder of who you are, the grandeur and the greatness, but to be changed by beholding you in the face of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.